Hi everyone, I'm Justin McLeod, Director of Public Relations and Marketing for Roanoke City Public Schools. And over to my right, your left, is Mrs. Verlita White. She is the new superintendent of Roanoke City Public Schools. And if you noticed, we are social distancing today, so we are not wearing our masks. Mrs. White, thank you for joining us today. Simply put, we went back to the drawing board, did we not? Thank you, Justin. And in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. We have our original plan that we will get to eventually, but just like any good teacher, when we're teaching a lesson and we realize that something is getting in the way or we have an obstacle, we have to adjust the lesson. We can't just keep teaching. And so when it comes to the reopening plan, we had to do the same thing as our responsible teachers do. We had to take a look at our health and safety data. You know, in Roanoke City, we have double the number of COVID cases than in the surrounding counties. And that puts this in a different situation for us. We have to keep health and safety number one. If you remember the 10 point plan that we presented to the board, our number one is health and safety. So when we take a look at those numbers, it will require us to adjust our plan. And so we will be making that proposal to our board on Tuesday night. So what exactly is the proposed plan now? Give us an overview. Sure, thanks for asking the question. We're looking at having a predominantly virtual program for the first nine weeks of school, with a few exceptions. We are taking into account students who spend more than 50% of their day in the special education setting, as well as our level one English learners, as well as students who struggled um, in their junior year who would be attending Forest Park Academy. We are uh, having some exceptions in those cases because we know that it's critical to provide face-to-face -face instruction and those groups are small enough where we can manage and we can socially distance. But for the majority of our students, we are looking at going predominantly virtual. We have looked at this um, every way that possible. We have looked at every way that we can get students in person. We've looked at our four-day plan. We've considered elementary students. We've considered two-day options as well as four-day options. And then we finally realized, and the task force finally realized, that a predominantly virtual uh, start to the school year would be the most responsible and the safest start to the school year. I know a question some will have is, will the school system consider any in-person instruction beyond what you just said for the 2020-21 school year? Yes, and that's the reason why I started my first uh, answer with a yes and no, uh, with our going back to the drawing board. We know that the original plan was responsive based on what parents, students, teachers said that they wanted to be in school. One of the, the commonalities in the entire uh, feedback chain is that everyone wants students back in school. Our teachers, our parents, um, our students want to be back in school and we want them back in school. And so we know that eventually we will get there. Uh, we will get there, but hopefully by the second semester. But even in the second quarter, we're looking at bringing elementary school students back at least two days a week. So again, if all goes well and we get from the substantial range, which is where we are right now, we are in the uh, substantial range when it comes to community transmission. Hopefully we can go to more of a moderate range that would put us back in a phase two approach rather than phase one where we can have more students in person. So it will be virtual for the majority of our students at least for the first nine weeks. What will that look like? Because a lot of folks, a lot of our parents told us last spring just didn't cut it. Sure, and I know that that is the fear of everyone that, you know, what about uh, virtual learning and what will it look like? And keep in mind that in the spring, it is my understanding, and it happened across the country as well, that was emergency kind of virtual learning. And so we're no longer in the, that kind of mode right now. Right now, we're looking at effective instruction. We're looking at both synchronous and asynchronous instruction, meaning some face time with the teachers and having independent work as well. So going from same time instruction to any time instruction, making sure that the instruction overall is highly effective and engaging. So students will have the, the benefit of meeting with their teachers online. We talk about online, we certainly acknowledge the realities of some of our families. So what if a student needs a computer or internet access? 
Yeah, so we are working with Cox Communications to um, really have students connect with their uh, com Connect to Compete uh, program. And so any student who needs a connection, we will make sure that we are making that connection for them and that we are giving them access to uh, internet services. And then we are also providing laptops for our students as well. And we're also very concerned about feeding children. How will that work? How will we get meals to students? Yes. So we will continue our meal service as our buses go through um, the various neighborhoods to make sure that our students have um, uh, the food that they need. We certainly don't want any students suffering from food insecurities. And so we'll also make sure that if students, for instance, who are not part of the community eligibility kind of program, that if they need to apply, apply to the program they can. Okay, and it, when we talk about non-CEP schools, we're talking about Crystal and Grandin, and they can apply and qualify for free and reduced lunch. Yes. Uh, I know another question that we're hearing a lot about is the need for child care. Yes. What can we do? Yeah, so we are doing everything that we can to connect with our various agencies, and I just want to take a minute just to thank them because uh, I know that the City of Roanoke, as well as United Way and the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA, everyone is pitching in and trying to help because we know that child care is a real issue, not only for our many of our parents, but for our teachers as well. So again, this is about supporting and doing our best to support everyone, provide high quality instruction, and to take care of everybody. And Roanoke is certainly a caring community. I know you've seen that in just the few short months that you've been here. But to recap, uh, it's essentially the first nine is predominantly online for most of our students. What are the next steps? The, I guess the board, this is a proposal. It the board has to vote, right? The school yes. board. Yes, the board will vote on, the, is anticipated to vote on, um, on Tuesday, on August 11th. And so we will be laying out even more detail. And so the detail will have everything to do with those 10 points that we presented in the first um, proposal and the first plan. Um, from health and safety to curriculum, instruction, assessment, looking at um, professional development, the infrastructure, how we're able to do it. Again, we have to make sure that we are providing the best and high quality program for each and every one of our students. And so we want to do that in a responsible way as we move forward. Thank you, Mrs. White. We should mention that that school board meeting will take place at William Fleming High School at 6.30 p.m. If you are coming, please wear a mask. We're gonna have the, the seats taped for social distancing. And of course, you can watch it on our Facebook page. Thank you so much for joining us. And Thank you, it was Justin. very enlightening, and we hope you found this video useful and informative.